Hello and welcome back to Inside the Ruck. I'm Pat Clifton. I'm James Patterson. Let's dive right into it. Hey, this week, myself and Ryan, the man behind the camera, were down in Houston. You were at a game too. Yeah, I was in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I can tell you what. It takes me back to playing in Queenstown, New Zealand. I don't think there's a prettier venue in American rugby to have a game. And to be honest, I was just floored. So I've been going to Utah now for the last three years in MLR. And to see them come out of COVID, they had, what, 75% fan allotment in that game. So they had over 3,000 fans there. 60% of the population is vaccinated. People were side to side in a rugby field again. It was awesome to see. That's phenomenal. Look, I was impressed, too, down in Houston. I, I First time ever in an MLR game, almost somewhat ashamed to admit. Um, I went to some pro games back in the day. But first time at Aviva Stadium, I was knocked, knocked my socks off, frankly. It was the beta test of what can happen in this country. You had grassroots community rugby happening on the outside fields, a marathon of it as a curtain raiser leading up to the professional game. You had the pros and the coaches coaching the young guys, and then those guys wearing their eye black and their letter jackets into the game at night. I saw Japanese fans cheering on Kinsuke Hatakiyama, who obviously came for just that. I saw the one-off casual sports fans. It was a phenomenal weekend. Um, Let's cut to it. We've got a little bit of uh, interview action. We talked to Justin Johnson, the back row rookie for the New England Free Jacks. We'll go straight to that interview now after their victory over the Houston Sabercats. Someone would have told 16-year-old Justin that someday you'd be like a first-round draft pick playing professional rugby. What would he have said? Uh, he wouldn't believe it. I just have to say glory to God for putting me here. Thank you for everybody that has guided me here, all my fans, all the support, uh, the Free Jacks for drafting me. It's just a dream come true. I never thought I would be this far. I always wanted to play professional. I didn't know where I was gonna be. I played basketball, football, and then found my spot in rugby. So you just won pretty significantly. You're in your rookie season. You're getting a lot of minutes. You're starting. How often do you text Scott Lawrence to let him know he let one get away? <laughs> Not often, but Coach Lawrence was a big part of how who got me here. He was the one that helped me on my defense. So I credit me being here to Coach Lawrence and the Life University program. They're such a pr good program over there in Marietta, Georgia. I just want to put them on the map. How do you like playing with the collar? It's you know what I was I was against it at first, but it's actually a great look. Have you found yourself popping it yet in a game? Oh yeah, I popped it a couple times this game. You know when the the sidelines chirps at you, you know you just gotta pop the collar and keep going. You're a Cali boy. Why is that Waffle House on your arm and not in and out? Because you know I was in Georgia for the past four years. There's a Waffle House by. I loved Waffle House. You know I'm just trying to get a sponsorship for Waffle House. Get the first Waffle House in Boston. So you know I'll I'll try to sponsor it. What's your Waffle House order? Uh, Patty Mel hash brown bowl with a uh, um, cheesesteak hash brown bowl I usually get to about $10. Try Waffle House. So what did you think of that? Justin Johnson vying for the Waffle House sponsorship. <laughs> He's trying to get Waffle House to move up the Eastern Seaboard and move into Boston. He wants the first franchise. I mean, Mahomes got yeah, Whataburger, but Whataburger in Kansas came City. here, so why if not? If he can do it, Justin Johnson can get Waffle House. I mean, that's House. the quintessential American restaurant. Who doesn't love a bit of Waffle House? Absolutely. Such a character. Absolutely. Uh, well, let's dive straight into our headlines this week, why don't we? Um, I think the biggest one is the Giltini dominance. I mean, almost 100 points through two weeks. These guys look unbeatable. Uh, everybody needs to pump the brakes, okay? Uh, like, yes, they're a great side. They're very polished, but guys have to remember here, we've got people calling out on Reddit, which is probably the most brutal forum there is out there. I'm glad Reddit didn't exist when I was a player because I wouldn't have even come out of the sheds. <laughs> guys are calling for coaches' heads. Look, the Giltinis, they've got, what, 500 plus professional caps, probably more. Probably a thousand. Who are they playing? They're I playing mean, the Sea Wolves. Got a couple hundred in his own yeah. pocket, you know. They're, they're playing the Sea Wolves that have probably combined 150 professional caps. Guys, we haven't played rugby in a long time, and you've got a gut bunch of seasoned pros that have done this eat, sleep, repeat every year of their life for the last 10 years. Of course, they're going to be better than everybody else at the beginning. But I can tell you what's going to happen. As these guys get experience and they get comfortable being back in the game again, that gap's going to come screaming tight. And we're going to see closer matchups. Everyone's thinking the Guiltinis will run away with it. You know, I'm a fan of the way they play. They play quick. But as teams get experience against that and they start to get more work in week to week, that gap will close. It's tough to tell, right? I mean, everybody's looking here and trying to figure out why the Giltinis are better. And I think there's a few conclusions, armchair conclusions floating out there. Um, one is that they have a better coach. You love Darren Coleman coming into the season. I think a lot of people think that they're very, you know, they get to the line. They know what they're doing. They execute very quickly. There doesn't seem to be a lot of indecision. Everybody has clear communication. Another one, though, that I don't think you can ignore is the fact that they have the least amount of 
you know, week one, zero Americans in the starting lineup. The only domestic player was DTH Vander Merva. They've got the least amount of uh, domestic players playing in the league. And, you know, frankly, you got Ben Sima, an American kid who's, you know, outside of MLR, his best experience, and outside of being an international cap, his best experience is playing for Rocky Gorge, a Division II club in Maryland, going against Matt Gitto. We can't ignore that. At the end of the season, it will still be Benzema against Matt Gitto. Well, and I think they're making a big mistake on one side because, yes, they've invested in their team this year. Okay, long term, they're not going to have these guys together. And I know they want to make a splash in their opening season, but how do you let a guy like Mika Kruse walk out on you and you trade him? Yeah. You trade Mika Kruse to the Utah Warriors, who I think look really good. He's one of the best young players in the league, and you let him walk out? Well, they got a log jam back there. I mean, you got DTH Vandermerva, you got Adam Ashley Cooper, you got John Ryberg. I mean, there's only so many minutes to go around. Frankly, I was relieved to see Cruzette go to Utah because I want to see that guy on the pitch, and I think he'll get on the pitch in Utah. You put him in the midfield or put him anywhere. They got the Bash brothers in the midfield. You've got Mikey Teo on the outside. Yeah. They look great. Utah looked a cut above. Well, we've talked about it, right? It's grassroots versus professional rugby. And the two undefeated teams in the, right now in this league are professional rugby, the Guiltinis, against a pretty grassroots side in the Utah Warriors. You have an American head coach in Sean Pittman. You got Mikey Teo. You got Mike Baska, the Kansan running at scrum half. And when he goes off, you got a Canadian coming in. This clash of grassroots versus pro isn't something to hide from. It's what the league is built on and what we're excited to see. I can't wait to see these guys guys go head to head and see who wins the Western Conference. A couple of other things we need to talk about: Scrum Panic. That's one of the other overreactions. There's some people freaking out a little bit about some of these Scrum resets. I talked to Kellen Gordon, uh, Seattle Sea Wolf uh, prop. He didn't seem to be too bothered by it, to be honest. You with. know what? In the end, people want to see rugby played on the field, not scrums getting reset. I think at the beginning, people are complaining because scrums are dropping and they're losing their dominance. But give the refs a few weeks to even get their head around this. You know, we had a discussion with the referee panel and we said to them, what, what do you consider consecutive scrums? Like, if you drop the first scrum, you go and you do this repeated infringement down by the goal line, is that going to be a card? Yeah. Are you going to get a penalty on the first one instead of a reset? So they're going to figure that out. Yeah. Then you'll get that scrum advantage again. It still doesn't change the fact that you need a good platform to attack off. You've got to have a good scrum to attack off anyway. Yeah. Most of the tries in the league are scored off set piece. Absolutely. And to your point, like... This is COVID. These guys haven't played rugby in over a year. Realistic rugby. You know, I think a lot of us armchair referees and armchair critics just had some complaints built up to get out too. Yeah. So let's let this thing get going. Uh, COVID just getting started. Referees, players alike. So what about this weekend? I'm sitting there. Out of nowhere, some, it just comes and tackles me, yeah? The Black Panther. Okay. The Utah Warriors have announced their mascot. Now... I don't want to put it out there, but he came up to me initially and he had a lot of venom and fire to spit against the Sabercats mascot, Scratch. Really? Yeah. Wow. yeah. So he trains at altitude. Okay. So he's, uh, he's calling him out. They play April the 26th, I think, or 24th up there. He wants to race Scratch. Well, I don't want to be uh, too... Look, he's going to win. Let me be honest. Scratch, what, the, pa the, Panther the Panther or Scratch? Scratch leaves a little bit to be desired in the athletic body type situation. I met Scratch this weekend, took a picture with Scratch. Speed doesn't seem... To, I, Scratch is more of a front rower. Let's be honest. Scratch is more of a front rower. So if it's a race, my I'm going to go with the unnamed Black Panther. Do you have a name for him? I thought you... Did you say Haka Khan? Yeah, someone said Haka Khan, but I, I, no, I don't think that's the name. Okay, well, that's what I think it should be. There's been a couple of big signings this week, all right? One of the other subplots of this early season is injuries. Um, Kellen Gordon, we're going to tell his story next week on Inside the Ruck. Down in Houston, and unexpectedly gets a call from his old team, the Seawolves. Hey, can you prop for us this week? The Seawolves also reach out this week and sign Gavin Prentice, the 20-year-old prop out of Harvard. His father, of course, Chris, Chris Prentice, one of the big benefactors up there in Seattle rugby. This guy came up through the Cerevi and Atavis and Era, All-American, all-everything, a giant offensive lineman for Harvard. But still, they had to go dig pretty deep to get guys out. And those injuries are going to play a, a role throughout the season. I think that's part of why we're going to see some mid mid-season signings, but one of those big mid-season signings was none other than Hanno Dirksen, which seems like a really dangerous addition for Nola Gold. More than 150 caps for the Ospreys. I mean, that's a big pickup for a team that's already doing quite well. Yeah, and you look at some of the other things where injuries hurt teams. So I thought Jason Robertson going down, leading point scorer last season. You know, it looked like the OGs were a little bit frazzled the week before, 
but then they come out and they throw a guy like Tusa Tala in there. Yeah. How good of a player is he? What, what I love about him is he's a sevens guy with, yeah. the, with the Samoan. Se you play a little fly half, you play a little scrum half, you're, you can be comfortable in a bunch of different positions. And if something goes wonky, just put those sweet feet to work and that's exactly what he did. Well, that's going to do it for our first segment. We're going to throw it and when we come right back, we're going to come back with a little profile behind the scenes with the man, the myth, the legend, Taylor Howden down in Houston uh, when we come back. Tell them it's cause I like it Play with sticks, bats, or gloves. We don't wear shoulder pads or helmets. We keep playing when it hurts. And we leave everything on the field. What we wear must be built for our game. I'm the journeyman, so Woodlands. Texas Elite, Aspen, season with Glendale, Denver Highlanders, Denver Barbos, Columbus Rugby Club, 1823, Ohio Aviators, obviously 2016, Ohio Aviators, and then Tanola, Tiger, Houston. 19-year-old New Zealander Taylor Houghton came to the USA in 2006 to visit his mom, who'd remarried and moved to Houston, and to meet his newborn baby sister. He was only supposed to stay two weeks. 15 years later, after dancing through midfields from coast to coast, he's back in Houston, having played for seemingly every club in America. Next long bus trip with your team, kill some time trying to find someone in American rugby who isn't within six degrees from Taylor Howden. Hi, Club. Uh, yeah, I know Toddy a little bit, not, not, not well. Never played with him, yeah, played against him. Colin Isles? Oh, so I actually played with Carlin when he first hit the scene. He played for Aspen one summer. Bro, we were in Kansas City, but his first tournament was in Kansas City on the Blues field there, the, um, what do you call that, Swope Park? Yeah and in, in uh, like 110 degrees and 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 we we used to get the water and we used to pour the, we wouldn't even drink the water you'd pour the water on your boots but he was played for aspirin and he was just like burning people blitzing people cut a prior who plays for new york his older brother dan uh, and i went to school together howden arrived in 2006 infinity park opened in 2007 the USA Sevens moved to Las Vegas in 2010, the same year the CRC was founded, sold out Soldier Field in 2014, the 2016 Rio Olympics, and the Sevens World Cup in 2018. Howden's been here a long time, and he's had a front row seat for some of the American game's major watershed moments. Who better to encapsulate how far we've come? You come here, and then you go to a game on the weekend, and then you just rock up and you just change on the sideline. If you need to get like your ankles taped or your shoulder strapped or something like that, you just got to go and, you know, like bring your own tape and sit on the sideline and strap your shoulder up or whatever. If you look around here, Aviva, like we're super, super lucky to have this stadium. Uh, the pitch, the practice pitches, the gym now, um, all the backroom staff that continue to work uh, behind the scenes really hard. You know, it does put in perspective like, wow, you're so lucky to have this opportunity in a, in a, a league that's growing, you know what I mean? And hopefully this professional rugby in America continues to grow. When professional rugby arrived, Howden was one of the first to be plucked from the grassroots. He's played in every season of professional rugby ever since, but he hasn't missed many chances to play for free either. Obviously being a professional rugby player is unreal. Um, it it's definitely was a, was a, was a dream as a, as a youngster. Uh, never thought it would happen in America. And for me, like I, I think the club game is, is, is a, a hugely important part of, of the, the makeup of rugby in the, around the world. A couple of years ago, I'd go play Nola Gold, and then the off season, I'd go back to Columbus, and I'd play, I don't know if they know this or whatever, but I'd go play, go play in the fall, go play the club rugby with the boys in the fall. Because I think that's what, that's what rugby's about, is about playing the game with your mates, 
and having fun and enjoying it. Obviously it's good being a, a professional rugby player and having that, this game become professional in America, but you've got to still, you've got to still go with the clubs, you've got to still go to play club rugby. Give back to those, to those local clubs because those are the ones that in, you know, in this competition or in this, in this country, the majority of the players come through that club system. If you're going to learn faults tomorrow, you still play rugby? 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I'll play. What Pro Rugby has done for Howden, above justify a Wikipedia page, is give him the ability to pass on his rugby ethos to the next generation. When with NOLA, he ran their academy side, and now he's helping coach Houston's. The way to move forward is these Americans have to continue to be coached well, at not just this level, but at a the collegiate level, the high school level, all the way through the youth, absolutely love coaching. So I love seeing these young kids running around laughing and having fun, smiling when they're running with the ball. If you can't connect with the kids or, or the, the team that you're coaching, I reckon you'll struggle. Coaching for me, bro, I'll, I hope to be uh, coaching for a long time. What's Howden's secret to a long, fulfilling rugby career that includes cashing a check? It might be simpler than you think just playing for the love of the game. We had a game today, we played the Austin Huns. Uh, we lost the game, they were a good team. But you could kind of see our players were playing the game, you know, it was like they were a little bit afraid to make a mistake. Or they, they, they didn't, you know, they were, they were so worried about getting to the next level that they, they forgot about what they had to do right here. That, that's, a, that's a key part of it is, is, is yeah, you've got a, a goal and, and, a, and a place that you want to get to, but if you're thinking about getting to that place right away, then you're gonna you're gonna miss step you know two, three, four, five, and six in order to get there. And that's the whole sort of beauty of the journey, really, is that you gotta you gotta sort of work through and grind through the, the, the middle part, you know, in order to get the fruits of your labor later on. Welcome back to Inside the Ruck. I hope you enjoyed that little uh, peek behind the scenes with Taylor Howden. What a fun guy, huh? A guy I know you know pretty well. A guy yeah. I know pretty well. Uh, a good dude. Yeah, he came and played for us at the Kansas City Blues a few years ago, and. I tell you what, I had to endure a few bus trips where he was driving and I'm sitting in the passenger seat and he's just singing for nine hours. Now, Taylor, great guy, excellent choice in music, execution's just a little bit lacking. What's on the playlist? Oh, anything from New Zealand. Loves a bit of 660 from New Zealand, loves a bit of reggae, oh, loves okay. a bit of classic rock. You know, he's well-rounded, like a, like a rugby player. Yeah, Flight of Concord soundtrack, that's the best I can come yeah, up with from right. New Zealand. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, anyways, let's dive into, uh, zoom into some of these player matchups this week. We've got four games on tap. A little dial back, you know, a little diet weekend in Major League Rugby. Not quite the, the, the huge loads we've had. Uh, let's start right here with Utah, 2-0 going up against the New England Free Jacks, 1-1. One one. Huge win, 32 nothing for the Free Jacks on the weekend. They're coming up. Utah is riding a high. Um, we've got a couple of big-time playmakers, Clive and Lobster, the uh, Namibian 10 for Utah going up against Dougie Fife, the Scottish 15 we've talked about a little bit. What do you think about this matchup? I really like the matchup. So talking to Sean Pittman last week before the game, they've got really, they got Schulte, fantastic kicker of the ball. Yeah, and then they put Lubz there at the back. And he's another good kicker. In the weekend, he had over 200 meters kicking. You know, he's dynamic at the back. He's a small shifty player. He's able to do very well at the back. So he gives them the dual threat from a kicking and a counter-attacking perspective. Obviously Fife in the weekend, how good was he? Unbelievable. Massive amount of line breaks, huge amount of running meters, made a boatload of tackles this season. He's a really class player. Yeah, without question. I mean, 277 running meters for Dougie Five so far. I don't think it's a shock, and I don't think I think he's gonna keep racking it up. Big, fast, skilled, tough to beat. And and how does it change your game plan? So let's talk about this. You've got these these dynamic 15s that are dual threats. A, a 15 that can kick and a 15 that can run. Does that change your game plan? Like in the weekend, I saw one of the most interesting battles. You could tell they came into the game premeditated. You know, Sean Pittman talked about it. He said, we're just gonna bang it down there, make Toronto make mistakes, and then we're gonna punish them. And they did. They gave away a penalty. Schulte slotted over from 55 meters. He can put the ball anywhere. Then you have the classic example on the other side. He says, we're gonna, we're gonna show them the outside and see if they kick back to three players. And every time the arrows would just boot the ball back to a standing back three. They should have tested him on the edge. You've got to bring players back and forwards in the system to find space. Kicking is not the answer. Finding space with kicks is the answer. 
I mean, the Arrows are having a tough season, which we'll pocket and we'll talk about that later. But I am super impressed by Pittman and the Utah Warriors staff so far and what they've done. Really good stuff. Um, let's dive down. We've got ATL 1-1 one and one taking on San Diego 1-1. One and A one. couple of big studly locks in this. Johan Momsen, the South African for ATL, and Ben Mitchell, the big Irishman for San Diego. What do you make of these cats? Yeah, I'm going to be at, at, at Atlanta this weekend. I can't wait to see Momsen on film. He is imposing. Right? He's a massive player. So look at the, him this season. 19 ball carries. He's got 127 running meters. I think that's pretty much leaving his side. He breaks tackles, 11 broken tackles this season. I think that leads his side as well and gets through a mountain of work on defense. Without question. Ben Mitchell has been one of the better locks throughout this entire Major League Rugby experiment that we've been going on. Played in Austin. He's moved around a little bit. Um, found a good home and settled in there in San Diego. He's got 19 carries a season for 80 running meters. Forced three turnovers and probably more importantly, two line-out steals. That's going to be tough to accomplish this week against Johan because he's quite the line-out operator. But that's the battle, right? These two guys in the lineout could be the difference in a close game. Especially when you look at a team like Atlanta. Their lineout is probably their pivotal attacking phase. They're excellent at mauling off the lineout. We saw what they did against Toronto. We saw what they did last week in facets against the OGs. Yeah. They're going to be good. I've been watching Scott Lawrence coach rugby for a long time, and the line out to the driving mall is the trademark, the calling card. Get used to it, MLR fans. How do you think you feel at training? Like being an outside back at training, knowing Lawrence doesn't shy away from contact during the week. He makes them hit each other. He's like, we're going to hit, hit, hit. So it's repetition, repetition, using our bodies. But then you're going into a heading drill and you're running into rigs like Momsen the whole time. Yeah. We got 50, 60, 70 healthy bodies down there in Marietta between Rugby ATL, 404, and all the life teams. You got a, you got a few casualties you can work through. Um, now we got the Arrows who are reeling a little bit, 0-2. Um, let's look at Manuel Diana going up against Jameson Fanana Schultz. I think quickly becoming the favorite of the show. We love to talk about this guy. He's having a blinder of a season. The Arrows, I know you had some comments on them that they didn't look like the most inspired team last weekend. You know I can't even pretend to know what it's like. Yeah, we used to go on tour and we go to South Africa. We were away from home for three weeks, but we knew we were coming home. These guys have moved to another country. They're not going home this season. So it's going to take some adjustment. They're moving into a different environment. Travel routines are changed in week routines. We talked to the coach, Chris Silverthorne, a few weeks ago, and he said, like, I don't know how to manage players because the risk that you run when you're away this long is that it's rugby, 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 and there's no balance. So what are they doing? Yeah, in their off weeks, are they being able to spring in leisure time? They can't leave. Yeah. So they're stuck at a hotel. So they're in this little bubble. They're trying to figure things out. I could tell I was field side there. And to be honest, there was no communication on defense. It didn't look there was a lot of enthusiasm. And there, we've talked about this before with the South American players. When they're hot, they're like a spark plug. But when they get in behind, they, they shut down a little bit. And you could see that in facets of the game. In that second half, they came alight. Manuel Diana, he was great. You know, in the game so far, he's had a lot of offloads, three offloads. He's carried 27 times. He's got 163 running meters. He makes a lot of tackles. Guys like that, when they start to build the momentum, that's when the team needs to rally behind them and still going. Keep going. And Jameson, I mean, those numbers compare really well to Fanana Schultz, who's having an objectively fantastic season. So I don't think you can pin it on Deanna. You know, he's had he's forced three turnovers, Fanana Schultz. He's had 28 carries to Deanna's 27, 136 meters to Deanna's 163, and just about the same amount of touches. So he's Deanna himself is putting in a fantastic performance. He's going to have to do it this week if they're going to find a win against Old Glory. Well, you heard Bree at halftime. She was talking to Gary Gold, or spoke to Gary Gold before the game. Gary Gold was at a game, and he, it, how good was it to hear the U.S. coach saying, look, this is the best thing for the Eagles. Guy's playing professional rugby week in, week out. And he's like, I'm here tonight, and I'm watching, well, it was the afternoon, sorry. We're here, we're watching four or five Eagle players that are in contention, plus the open mind that someone else is going to stick up their hand. Yeah. Like, when did this happen? And when was a USA coach actually in the States to recruit? Yeah, it's pretty fantastic. Uh, to like, see. Yeah, and it's good to see Gary Gold here. Uh, Gary, I, he puts a lot of work into this, and I know he—, he This is, I mean, this is, he's a pig in mud right now, right? Gary loves to watch rugby. He loves to, to scout his teams. The first year he was here, he had to go all over the UK and England and the championship to all these different clubs. Be able to come here and not only 
see everybody, to make inroads, to talk to the Scott Lawrence's, the Sean Pittman's, the coaches throughout the league. Uh, he's a, a pig in mud, absolutely. Okay, so for the last game we're going to profile this week, we're going to play a game here, okay? I'm going to give you a team and you're going to guess, all right? all right? Guess any team here. Okay, so there's a team that's first in the league in line breaks, running meters, second in the league in tackle breaks, ball carries, all right? I'm going to give you the stats. 17 line breaks through two games, 51 tackles broken, 253 ball carries. So they must have had the ball a lot, yeah? The yeah. other team must not be scoring any points. 1,500 running meters. Okay. Who do you think it is? It's got to be the Giltinias or maybe the Nola Gold. Both of those guys have put a lot of points on the board, a lot of offense. Got to be one of them. No. Houston Sabercats. No. The Houston Sabercats. Mind blown. Reading through the stat sheet, and I'm just looking, I'm like... What's going to happen this week? And I see these statistics, and then you read through the Reddit forum that's saying, get rid of the coach, call the coaching staff. Guys, like, the reason they're not getting there is because they missed 48 tackles. Second worst in the league, and they've only scored one try. But if you keep producing those kind of attacking offensive numbers, it's eventually going to click. It's chemistry. You talk about line breaks. It's about feeling each other in open space. It's about finishing. They're this close from these scores going completely opposite direction. It may just be the loudest voice in the room, that, that an example of that, because, you know, everybody was in their seat till the end. They didn't score a single try, 32 nothing. but let's not forget, Sabercats victorious in week one against the Seattle Seawolves, and this week they were out with Taylor Howden, their starting 12. They were out Zach Pangelinen, who was their captain in the first week. They were out a few guys, so, you know, look, give them a little, it's early days, uh, so let's not overreact with Houston. Uh, this week, though, I, you got to feel like it's a bit of a must win. The voices are only going to get louder and more dissenting if they do not win the Texas Club cash or Texas Cup clash this week against Austin, who hasn't won a game yet. They've only got seven line breaks, dead last in the league. 23 penalties, the most in the league. Those are the two stat lines that you do not want out there. Austin with a ton of you know, a few All Blacks in the back line, a ton of uh, Eagles, a ton of experience. Um, they're just not being able to get it done so far. I love everything. Like I love everything they do off the field. They're so big. So everybody, I felt like every rugby fan in the States was watching that game last week, just willing the Gilgronies to win. And they just couldn't finish. But again, they're improving week to week. Now, the biggest thing that came out of that game is Bryce Campbell being okay. I, my heart absolutely sank seeing that injury. And just for everybody at home, the team says he's back with the team this week. He's back in the team environment. You know, we hate to see injuries like that. Anytime an injury is involved with a neck or a head injury, everybody just holds their breath. It was a very somber moment in that game, and I'm sure his family at home and the rest of his teammates, the rest of his family is able, happy to have him back again. Absolutely. Bryce Campbell, good on you. Uh, let's dive in now to our favorite segment of the week, Fan of the Week. This time we got someone live and in person, Dave Redzinski of the New England Free Jacks. I see this character. I, I know this guy from social media, right? Rugby world's a small world in America. I know him from social media. I, I had no idea who he was. I see him. They score their first try of the game in the first two minutes. He runs down to the con, like down to the right behind the benches, on the, and is just taunting all of the Houston SaberCats <laughs> fan. I'm like, this is definitely the, the the fan of the week. So hopefully, enjoy this little chat we had with New England Free Jacks and rugby fanatic David Rudzinski. We'll let him take you out on that. For James Patterson, I'm Pat Clifton. This has been Inside the Ruck. Hope you enjoyed. I've seen two Free Jack wins now. I saw the Rooney game last year in Vegas, and I've seen this game here, and I think this is the start of big things for these guys this year. I flew down this morning, flying back tomorrow, but it was worth it to see them start to get untracked a little bit. Oh, next week we have the home opener up in Boston, and I think, you know, with the COVID guidelines, we're gonna fill it as much as we can. Here, what I think you saw from the Free Jacks, which you're gonna see a lot more of, is they they punched them in the face. They really came, and literally and figuratively, and they came out and their defense was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, they had so many penalties. They had two guys in the bin and they held them out. So I love Waffle House. My kid went to school in South Carolina, so I've spent plenty of time at Waffle House at two in the morning. You know, I'd rather have Nando's. Let's get a Nando's into Boston, because I want that chicken. Well, I went down and I said, let's go. And I had the whole entire stadium was filled with Sabercat fans. And there was one guy with a Free Jack shirt running around. I got yelled at by a couple of locals, but I won't get into what they said. It's not good for your show. 